Dear all, welcome to UMAC lecture series and joining us. I'm Sarah Ng, the creator of UMAC. Today, our lecture is Reconsidering Chinese Art, conducted by Ms. Roseanne Hui, an art historian and the, and the director of Han Mo Xuan, Hong Mak Yin, a reputable arts, oh, sorry, a reputable arts publishing house based in Hong Kong. We are very honored to have her sharing her recent research on Fu Bao Shu's arts and the intersections of arts and politics. Wu Sen received her BA honors in art history and BA in economics from Blanc University. She also has a JD from the University of Hong Kong. She is going to share with us about how Fu Bao Shu employed classical methods and modern elements in iconic landscape painting in particular on the recurrent theme or scenes of constructions and heavy industry. With reference to Fu Baoshi's painting, essay, activities, and those of his Jiangsu contemporaries, her study actually provides a glimpse into how change and redevelopment were depicted and how interconnected arts and politics have come to be in post-1949 China. So we will have question and answer sections after the lecture. So you're welcome to submit your questions uh, to chat room to, to the Q&A box uh, at 1.50s. So without further delay, I would like to open the floor and welcome Rosanne. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Shuo and Florian, to you and your colleagues at the UMAC for inviting me to speak in this series. So as Sarah mentioned, today's talk will focus on Fu Baoshi's art after the establishment of the People's Republic of China. I'll begin with an introduction of Fu Baoshi to familiarize everyone with his life and artistic style. And then we'll look at some common themes employed by artists in the 50s. So this will hopefully set the stage for us to study a few of arts, Fu's artworks. We'll look closely at the recurrent notion of construction and heavy industry and his iconic landscape paintings, which I hope will illustrate how he incorporated modern elements and classical methods in his portrayal of the new China. So let me just go ahead and launch the PowerPoint. Share. There we go, is it working? Okay. All good? All right, um, so for those unfamiliar with Fu Baoshi, he was born on the 5th of October in 1904 in Xinyu, Jiangxi province. In his early 20s, he published his first book, The Origins of Chinese Painting, which marked the beginning of his scholarly career, during which he wrote more than 150 essays and books on the history and theories of Chinese art. From 1932 to 35, he had two, two stays in Japan to further his studies with the support of artist and educator Xu Beihong. He studied at the Imperial School of Fine Art in Tokyo, and he was under the instruction of King Barasego. In Japan, he was exposed to various subject matters and styles through viewing exhibitions and studying, and even translating Japanese art theory books. His, influence, uh, his experience in Japan largely influenced his artistic style. So here's an example. On the right, um, we see Noguchi Shohin's Orchid Pavilion, completed in 1901, uh, Lan Ping Tu. And on the left, we see Fu Baoshi's take on the same subject four decades later. The compositions are so similar that we wonder if Fu might have been directly inspired by Shohin's work. However, notice how Fu's version is more misty, less rigid, if you will, and carries a moody, ancient vibe reminiscent of the Six Dynasties, whereas Shahin's version seems more decorative, perhaps reflective of her career as a respectful imperial painter. So I've written an essay on this comparison, and I'd like to invite you to have a read. It's published in this book. Let me try to show it here. Um, it's not really... Okay. Anyways, um, oh, I'm not really working in the background. There you go. Well, it's published last year um, by the Nanjing Fu Baoshi Museum, uh, Fu Baoshi Jinian Gua. 
And um, it's a book of collected papers. So um, please have a read if you can get a copy. But if you can't, my essay can also be found on Hamo Shen's WeChat platform. In any case, this topic of Japanese influence on Fubashi has been eloquently covered by many scholars. So I won't go into it today. It was in Japan where Fubashi met Guomo Ro, who would become Fu's patron. So Guo was very close with Mao Zedong and had high political influence. This really helped Fu in his career under the Communist Party's New China later on. In 1938, Fu was appointed by Guo to serve as secretary in the third section of the political ministry, where he headed anti-Japanese campaigns during the Sino-Japanese War. So when the third section of the political ministry moved to Chongqing to escape Japanese military attacks, Fu Baoshi also moved there with his family. Less than two years later, however, he resigned in order to return to his teaching position at the National Central University, Zhongyang Daxie. And during his seven year stay in Chongqing, Fu had enjoyed considerable artistic freedom and was very much inspired by the beautiful landscape. So he created many masterpieces during this time. And here are two examples which he did in the 40s. You can see how good he was at portraying the rainscape. He also invented his signature Bausch texture stroke. Oh, here's um, Ode to the Fair Ladies um, that he also did in the 40s. Here's an example that shows how he did his Bausch uh, texture stroke, which he invented in the 40s. He also held several exhibitions, most notably one in 1942, for which he wrote a preface to the exhibition in Chongqing in the Renwu year. This essay provides substantial information on his thoughts and ideas and is a valuable source to art historians today. Um, as you can see, he also organized exhibitions um, in the late 40s, one in uh, Shanghai in 1947 on the bottom left and another one in uh, Nanchang. Towards the end of the 40s, Fu Baoshi had considered leaving China. He'd asked Tian Changzhao to help him obtain a teaching position in England. And here's a letter, um, only page one and four, unfortunately, um, that shows um, that Fu wrote in 1948 to a student, Zhang Tianying, asking Zhang to follow up with Qian. This did not work out in the end, unfortunately. Otherwise, his post-1949 artwork would have been quite different from what we'll see later on in this presentation. Um, here's a picture of Fu Baoshi with uh, Xu Bei Hong and Zhang Tianying. Another reason why he stayed was that he just bought land in Fu Hou Gang number six in Nanjing, and that's next to his friends Guo Yoshou and Xu Bei Hong as he'd illustrated early in the letter. He drew a little map, as you can see earlier. Um, and this was where he was built a new home. Perhaps he didn't want to give it up after saving up all for it. And um, this picture shows Fu and his family soon after they moved into the new home. You can see that Fu has a very big family. And after the People's Republic of China was established in 1949, much had to be done for the country to recover from war. The new leadership vowed to rebuild the country and it became apparent that artists were to become part of the country's collective effort to do so. To understand this, we go back to the 1942 Yan'an Forum on Literature and Art, where Mao delivered a speech that reestablished the role of art. Art should serve workers, peasants, and soldiers, or in Chinese, wen yi wei gong nong bing fu wu. The spirit of this talk on art and culture became the new leadership's guiding principle. To artists, this meant they had to play by a new set of rules. We fast forward to July 1949, the first Congress of the China Representatives of Literary and Art Circles was held in Beijing. Fu Baoshi was not invited to participate, even though there were a total of 12 representatives from Nanjing at the time. Some scholars consider him sidelined. At the same time, though, Fu had many politician friends who were in the Kuomintang, or the National Nationalist Party, um, who worked very closely with party chairman 
Jiang Jieshi. So we have people like Zhang Daofan and Luo Shishi, etc. Um, so it's perhaps natural for the Communist Party to be cautious regarding his political stand. After the establishment of the People's Republic of China, Fu was rehired as professor of Chinese painting and theories of Chinese painting at the Nan National Nanjing University. But because students considered him to be an ally of the Kuomintang, they refused to enroll in his class initially. Fortunately, he had the help of his friend Lai Shaoqi, representative of the People's Liberation Army, who encouraged students to take his class. But Fu's unclear political stand was not the sole cause of his problems. The central government initially tried to remove China's art by prioritizing popular art forms, such as woodblock prints and New Year's paintings, as they were considered more understandable by peasants. Since Fu was a traditionally trained classical artist, it was not helpful to his career that his art form was underappreciated at the beginning of the new era. So from 1949 to the mid-50s, we'd see Fu transition from struggling for acceptance to achieving recognition from the new leadership. But one might argue that there is, in fact, something in common between the state's cultural policy and Fu Baoshi's conceptions on art. The new leadership encouraged artists to innovate and find new ways to depict China in its new era. And Fu Baoshi, on the other hand, had always believed that change was important in any artistic endeavor. So here's a seal that he carved in the early 40s. It reads, Qi Ming Mei Xin, meaning born to be innovative. And Fu's preface to the exhibition in Chongqing in the Renwu year, here's a, um, a banner a picture that shows how it looked like at, at the time. There were not a lot of pictures showing this exhibition. Um, but Fu Baoshi wrote a preface, and it really offers insight in his, into his ideology. He wrote, Chinese art undoubtedly needs to change, but the question is how this should be done. Paintings cannot remain unchanged. Time, thoughts, material, and tools have been shaken up. If the Song and Ming dynasties did not come to an end, there wouldn't have been masters such as Wu Zhen, Ni Zhan, Shi Tao, and Ba Da. And in the same preface, Fu revealed where he would go for inspiration with subject matters. Not surprisingly, these sources include classical art history themes and events considered commemorable by ancestors, such as gathering at the Orchid Pavilion, which we saw earlier. And Fu was confident and even said that even though these subject matters are old, he painted them with new compositions. In the 40s, Fu had completed numerous masterpieces on classical subject matters. However, under the new leadership's policy, it'll be unthinkable that he should focus only on classical themes. So why? Fu's essay written in 1959 and entitled, Once Driven by Politics, Brushwork Becomes Different offers an explanation. Classical art, literature, and traditional philosophy taught artists to actively avoid real life and the working class. Traditional art theories prioritize literary elegance over down-to-earth, unrefined qualities of the commoner, condescendingly labeling it bisu in Chinese, meaning lowly and vulgar. This was clearly in contrary to the state's art policy, since art was supposed to serve workers to soldiers and peasants. Fu's implicit recognition of his previous incorrect indulgence on classical subject matters is probably one of his early formal declarations of his political alignment with the party. In addition to his well-known landscape paintings, he completed many figure paintings portraying figures that feature in the Songs of Chu, Chu Ci, in classical poems written in the Tang and Song eras and all the way up to the Ming and Qing periods, as well as scholars in historically known gatherings. But these works would not achieve the practical purpose of depicting the new China. Publicly, at least, he then turned his attention back to landscape paintings, and we'll discuss that later. We also have Fu Baoshi's 1961 essay, Thoughts of Change, So the Brush Must Not Remain Stagnant, and this essay summed up his thoughts on the subject of innovation. He wrote, since times have changed, life and emotions change alongside it. 
building upon existing technical foundations, we must courageously breathe new life into the brush, seek new forms and techniques so that we can express our love of the new era and new life through our brushes. We can see that Fu had gone along with the principles of Mao speech at the 1942 Yan'an Forum, at least in his public speeches. In the early 50s, the state began organizing artists to paint the history of the Communist Party, in particular, how it came to victory. Chairman Mao was extensively portrayed, so was his poetry. In fact, this trend was started by Fu Baoshi himself. Here is the first ever painting inspired by a Mao poem, which Fu Baoshi completed in August 1950. Note that it was very soon after 1949. And it inspired numerous other artists at the time to paint after Mao's poems. So Fu Baoshi really was a pioneer in this sense. Revolutionary basis was another common theme. And we also have the theme of construction, which is the focus of this discussion. These talks, uh, these works often showcase modern infrastructure and transportation vehicles. In the early 20th century, there were already paintings that included these non-traditional elements, such as this piece by Ma Xiangbo, um, who's not a professional artist, but he did this in 1933. Um, he painted some planes here to depict a, a scene from the defense of the Great Wall. Um, and there were more and more of these kinds of paintings in the 50s, and they tend to depict large crowds of people, heavy industry, and large-scale construction sites. The message conveyed is clear. Under the leadership of the Communist Party, society thrives and prospers. The viewer was constantly reminded of the accomplishments of the party and that together they were progressing towards an ideal world. Fubashi had completed many such works that depicted milestones accomplished by the party. Um, we have some examples here. Uh, crossing the Dadu River, commemorates a historically significant event in which 17 soldiers crossed the Daju River, allowing the Red Army to continue their retreat toward Yan'an. And below we have the Four Snows of Minshan Only Makes Us Happy, which is Fu's another take on Mao's poem, The Long March. Both of these works were exhibited at the first national Chinese painting exhibition in Beijing in 1953, as you can see in the catalog on the right here. But Fu Baoshi really established his national reputation with this gigantic landmark piece, such as the beauty of our rivers and mountains, Jiangshan Ru Ci Duo Jiao. At the time, artists all over China were asked to produce drafts based on the line Jiangshan Ru Ci Duo Jiao from Mao's poem. And Fu's draft, this one, was selected to be used to decorate the Great Hall of the People in Beijing which was built to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. And Guanshan Yue was arranged to assist Fu Baoshi. Here's a photo of them at work. Guanshan Yue is on the left and Fu Baoshi on the right here. When Zhou Enlai and other officials first inspected the piece though, they criticized it because they thought that the sun was too small. The painting was subsequently revised just in time for a national day on the 1st of October, 1959. Fubashi himself was not satisfied with the outcome and wanted to further revise it, but he was told to let it go. This commission work illustrates how artists at the time had to face the challenge of balancing artistic creation while catering to the demands of officials who often had very little knowledge in art. And here's another example. Fu Baoshi painted Tu Li Shu Yi, poem of Mao Zedong in 1958, to participate in the art exhibition from socialist countries in Moscow um, between 1958 and 1959. Because of the political implications of the exhibition, Fu's work came under increased scrutiny. He shared his work at a few pre-exhibition viewings, received feedback, and created a revised version. According to his colleague, Wang Dafo, Fu complained to him that his work looked rather like the advertisement on the lid cover of a tooth powder brand. An example is shown on the right here. Um, and this kind of advertisement can be compared to something like a mooncake box from the 50s. 
And tooth powder um, was uh, the equivalent of a toothpaste back in the days. So clearly, Fu Baoshi was not satisfied with the result. And this once again shows how the state's intervention on autistic creation influenced aesthetic quality. One might say that under the circumstances, the artist was seen as a craftsperson or an art worker whose job was to execute his patron's vision instead of his own. Bearing in mind that artistic creation in post-1949 China served to promote the state's policies, it'll be interesting to see how art organizations reacted to the Great Leap Forward, which was launched in 1958. The aim of the movement was to quickly turn China into an industrial nation. People's communes were introduced and steel production was considered the pillar of economic development. In August 1958, the Central Committee passed a resolution that set the steel production target to 10 million and 700,000 tons. Ultimately, this led to a disastrous famine when China was struck by natural disasters between 1959 and 1961. At the time, though, artists continued to portray a thriving society. They participated in guided tours to different parts of the country and painted what they saw in a positive light. The art world's collective effort in collaborating with the state can be seen in specific targets they set for themselves. In March 1958, the committee of the Shanghai Chinese Painting Academy initiated a competition against Chinese painting institutes in Beijing and Jiangsu. Targets include have 60 to 70% of members be considered leftist and leftist, combine elements of traditional Chinese painting with workmanship, have 45 painters created, create works that are related to serving socialism, train 100 worker peasant amateur artists within five years. So you can see there are, these are very specific goals. And here's a photo of Fu Baoshi training amateur peasant artists at the time. And then the committee of the Nanjing branch of the China Artists Association proposed similar goals in response to the Beijing China Artists Association's call to make an art version of the Great Leap Forward. And after, the Jiangsu Traditional Chinese Paintings Institute put out four similar goals in response to Shanghai, such as completing 1,500 paintings that reflect the reality within the year. A number of exhibitions with very specific themes in Jiangsu garnered much attention from the central government. By then, Jiangsu artists were considered the, by the party leadership as the model to artists in all of China. In a private interview that took place in the 90s, scholar and artist Xie Zhiliu, who was part of the leadership in the Shanghai art world, explained that Jiangsu artists were given the important task of glorifying the new China through art because they were considered revolutionary. The Culture Bureau of Jiangsu Province was appointed to establish the Jiangsu Traditional Painting Institute in 1957. Fu Baoshi was appointed to head its establishment in February. And um, here's a photo showing the meeting at which this institute was established officially in uh, 1960, which was three years after um, 1957. The institute assembled artists, including Qian Songyan, Song Wenzhi, Wei Zixi, and Ya Ming, who collectively recorded sceneries in the Jiangnan region and elsewhere, and whose works well reflected the mission they carried with them. Here's a photo of Fu Baoshi painting at the Institute at the time. And Fu Baoshi led the Institute to producing many group works, with a well, um, one of the most well-known ones being this one. The people eat for free. People's communes are great. It was completed in 1958. And we have another example, Fight for Steel. Most of these works are signed collective works of the Jiangsu Traditional Painting Institute. Perhaps it's only appropriate that they don't exhibit any distinctive individual traits by any one artist. Here's a photo that shows how a collective work was executed at the time. So you can see Fubasha on the right there. 
The Institute was monumental in facilitating an important sketching trip that took place between September and December in 1960, in which Fu Baozhi led a group of 12 artists from the Institute to travel and paint within China. They covered six provinces and over 10 cities, a highly publicized exhibition was held in Beijing in May 1961, showcasing 150 paintings produced from the trip. The exhibition was called New Landscape, Open Air Paintings by Jiangsu Traditional Chinese Painters, or Shanghe Xinma, Jiangsu Guohua Jia Xiaosheng Zuopin Zhanlan. As shown here, this exhibition um, was very well received. On the left, we see um, Fu Baoshi showing Guomo Ro around, and in the middle um, is school secretary Wang Tingfang. Um, and on the right, we see a catalog that was published for the exhibition at the time. The catalog was inscribed by Kang Sheng, um, as you all know, it, an important party official at the time. So um, you can see how highly viewed this exhibition really was. Among the audience was a uh, comic artist, Ye Qian Yu, who was also head of the department of Chinese painting of the China Central Academy of Fine Arts. In response to the show, he pointed out a problem artists faced at the time, referring to new Chinese art that were exhibited in the 1953 and 1955 National Chinese Painting Exhibitions. He commented that even though such artwork depicted new content, something seemed to be missing. So what seems to be missing? To this question, he answered, that new Chinese painting was still lacking in artistic attraction. In order to solve the problem, he proposed that artists reinvent Chinese brush techniques so that they didn't need to start afresh with some other entirely new painting methods to portray new forms. And to him, Jiangsu artists were exemplary because they did exactly that. They experimented with possibilities and paved way for this new discovery of Chinese ink art. Ye's comments highlighted the apparent difficulty in documenting reality while balancing aesthetic quality. Fu Baoshi recognized this problem and in fact proposed a solution earlier. He said, making art is not like making a documentary. We must work hard to elevate documentaries into works of art. It's not surprising that Fu Baoshi disagreed with the Communist Party's rigid top-down control over artistic expression at the time. Speaking at a symposium in the Beijing Chinese Painting Academy in 1959, he said, under leftist influence, flower and bird painters were frustrated as they could no longer depict wilting lotuses and could only paint peonies. And then he went further to say that this method of categorizing art into three types, beneficial, the first type, not harmful, the second type, and harmful, the third type, is a source of pressure to landscape artists, flower and bird artists, and artists that specialize in classical figures, such as myself. Now this symposium was of a small scale, perhaps, the reason as to why Fu was willing to publicly express his frustrations. Other artists and attendants were also recorded to have spoken rather honestly about their thoughts. And of all the essays and speeches that Fu made officially, few imply, let alone state his discord with the party's intentions. So his speech at the Beijing Academy suggests that despite his agreeing with the party that Chinese art should evolve in order to serve the needs of the times. He also had his own different ideas regarding what art should be and how it should be understood. I'll attempt to argue that contrary to the then politically correct stand to emphasize on default themes while minimizing personal signatures in a painting, who seek to maintain his authentic touch as he took on new subject matters. The result is that even though he experimented with modern elements in his later works, he continued to use classical brushwork and was successful in maintaining a high aesthetic standard. To achieve this, Fubasha carefully designed the proportions of each composition. His sketches offer meaningful insight into how he translated any scenery into lines and portions to be painted with freestyle 
washed brushstrokes, skillfully balancing the linearity, the sharpness, the metallicness, if you will, of modern structures with a signature misty poetic landscapes that he's really known for. So here's an example. Um, this is the summit of Tatra Mountain. Um, a myriad of mountains here is laid out to occupy most of the composition. And connecting the mountains in the foreground to the ones further away on the left are a few parallel curved long lines that hover over a white mist of clouds. The mountains overlap one another, their features delineated by black contours, but the viewer's eye is given room to breathe by the white space that interspersed among surrounding rough rocky surfaces. Who's not on the corresponding sketch, as, as you can see on the left here, um, confirms that the lines depict the cable car. It's very small, but positioned right in the center of the piece, surrounded by vast nature. And this is an example of how Fu uses subtle modern elements to, to connect masses of mountains together. This way, human engagement in nature maintains it subtly, as is the case in classical Chinese paintings. This piece is one of many works that Fu created during an official trip to Eastern Europe in the summer of 1957. This trip culminated in over 50 paintings, a large portion of which offer a glimpse into his first attempt and inserting modern architectural and industrial elements into a wild landscape. And here are two catalogs that Fubaosher um, did after he'd returned from the trip. He wrote in the preface that using the form and techniques of traditional Chinese painting to depict things that I have never seen before is indeed a new challenge. These unpolished works are all the results of my thought battles and were a big test in my creative journey. Whose participation in this delegation was of a diplomatic nature. He praised Czechoslovakia and Romania for their modernization by incorporating signs of industrial progress in his paintings. Upon his return to China, some of his works like Ocaso of Czechoslovakia and Landscape of Sanaya, Romania, um, were exhibited at the National Day Art Exhibition on the 1st of October, 1957, and they were acclaimed as technically skilled and unique and said to have expressed the amicable relationship between China and Czechoslovakia and Romania. Fubasha was himself satisfied by his works. He did an interview with his student, Shen Zuoyao, referring to this piece, The Pride of Romanians, which depicts a hydropower station. He recalled the comments of a local viewer um, who said, no way in Romania can one see a panoramic site like that depicted in a painting, but this painting has indeed shown the entire construction site. Another viewer said, how can the human eye see both sides of the landscape at the same time? How come we never knew of this painting technique? This is incredible. These comments refer to Fu's skillful utilization of the scattered perspective technique. He incorporated scenes viewed from different angles into one frame, not unlike how classical Chinese artists put together different vantage points in different times in one scene. The final product is imagined and in effect an extension of what's visible to the human eye. Fu's experiments in Eastern Europe proved that his methods were successful in communicating industrial progress and development, which he would later apply as he painted to glorify China's own progress. Now, there is a video that recorded Fu Baoshi's sketching in Eastern Europe. According to Fu's son-in-law, Mr. Ye Zhonggao, it was given to the Beijing Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the time. So if any one of you has any leads or knows anyone in the China Film Archive, please let them know that there'll be a lot of interest if they can locate the video and make it available for public viewing. So we can see how Fu Baoshi painted back then. And coming back to Fu Baoshi's artwork, his spectacular mastering of the line is highlighted by his depiction of electric cables and railways. His method is distinctively different from the Gongbi style employed by other artists of the time, which probably remind us of architectural plans. In most of Fubash's construction themed paintings, cables and new architecture would only appear in the background 
as glittering symbols of modernity, such as in this one, yellow river dredged Huangqing, and in some other examples that I'll show you. Um, for instance, there's Steel City. There are two versions here. The chimneys are all at the back and the smoke's coming out, um, but they're not in the foreground. These elements um, seem to occupy the most space in the following works. This one, Gottwaldorf Square, that he did in Eastern Europe. Gottwaldorf, and a sketch that goes along with it. And Irkutsk Airport. Um, but they rarely take up the spotlight entirely. So I'm going to show you a rare example. Um, this one, on route in Fengman, Fengman Daoshang, in the collection of the Nanjing Museum currently. Um, this is an interesting exception, both in terms of composition and its showcase of Hu Baoshi's virtuous command of the line. This piece was inspired during an official trip organized by the General Office of the State Council uh, for Fu Baoshi and Guan Shanyue to sketch in the Northeast region of China, which began in June 1961 and lasted four months. Fu Baoshi left behind some literature regarding how electric cables came to be the main subject uh, of interest in this piece. Here's a photo of Fu. Um, so in his uh, literature, he wrote, on route in Fengman was a compositional experiment and a piece I was not confident about. At around 4 p.m., as we were in the car on our way back from a visit to the Fengman Dam, zigzagging downhill along the dam, seated next to the driver, I saw the myriad mountains before me, modern looking architecture sprinkled across the landscape on my right. I looked up, there were countless electric cables crisscrossed above my head. As I looked and remained in deep thought, as the car sped along, I felt that I was being introduced to the grandeur of the Northeastern landscape and the splendor of its electric modernization. So I sketched a few shapes in my notebook. The sketches of different types of cables that Fu mentioned have not been published. Perhaps they were lost, but here is a sketch called Qin An Jiang Dian Zhan. Uh, power station. Um, off th this offers some insight into how he envisioned the composition, even though they're not exactly the same one. Um, so here, Fu Baoshi delineated the electricity tower in the center of the piece and connected evenly spaced wires to it, providing strong visual support to the structure. The rest of the landscape followed in light pencil sketches. So depicting a different scene, but using a very similar logic, in unwritten phone line, Fu Baoshi painted the power cable proportionally large enough to overwhelm the viewer. This corresponds well to his description of how he came to see it himself. He constructed the electricity overhead tower with thick dry strokes that leave its impression in form rather than in full solid ink. Long thin lines stretch across the painting, boldly intercrossing each other and extending beyond the frame of the painting. The dance of the lines renders the power station calligraphic and expressive. These strokes carried within them memory of Fu's strong foundational training as a classical Chinese artist who can master the brush well enough to depict such vigorous lines. Another example in which the object of industrialization became the center point of a piece was Fu's portrayal of the coal mines in Liaoning inspired during the same trip to no Northeast China. He visited Fu Shun's West Open Mine in Liaoning province for a day on the 4th of August, 1961 and made sketches of the mines. Upon his return, he painted three pieces on the subject. Two completed on consecutive days on the 16th, so this one, and another one on the 17th of August, and a final one three years later in 1964. This is the first of the three, and Fu Baoshi inscribed on it. The Fushun mine is of the largest scale in all of China. There are many workers here, but one cannot see a lot of them. What a majestic sight. Here, black ink is naturally the dominant color, but misty patches of white space render the piece almost monochromatic. 
in all three versions, Fu used playful twists and turns of the brush to depict the endless, repetitive mind strata. There is a strong sense of rhythm implied not only by the chromatic portrayal of the strata, but also by the scattered puffs of white smoke. And this is particularly evident in the 1964 version as shown here. Some historic background on the Fushun West Outen mine here would be helpful. The mines contributed largely to China's economy since the founding of the People's Republic of China, but its mining activities began decades earlier. Initially, mining was prohibited in the Qing Dynasty because the area was where the Manchu's ancestors originated and was therefore considered sacred. But in 1904, Russians began mining there privately. Later, Japan defeated Russia in war and monopolized the mines following a treaty in 1909. The Japanese's mining activities have caused significant Chinese casualty. Furthermore, the mine was later used to support Japan's invasion of China. It's unclear whether Fubashi was aware of the mine's dark history, but it seems from the first painting's inscription that his focus was rather on glorifying the industrialization of the city. Little did he know that today the mine is exhausted and the city is struggling because of exploitation of the mines all these years. Politics aside, how did Fu manage to re reinvent a giant coal mine into a work of art? Let's take a look at his diary. He wrote, coal mines and city of steel are two subjects on which I made the most effort and which were the most challenging. I still remember as the caterer explained to me how much coal does mine produce every day, how, much, how many workers there were, he pointed to the layers of coal that, that was being mined and said, look, this color is so beautiful. I was shocked thinking to myself that this party member is an insightful artist. Nobody knows that coal is this dark in color and in a mine with hundreds of thousands of workers, it's filled with black smoke and dust. But in the eyes of this party member, it's beautiful. So how can I not paint this? It was technically challenging at first. Ink itself is black. Painting coal with black ink seems convenient, but this is not so at all. I am still not satisfied with how these few paintings turned out. So Fubashi was perhaps dissatisfied with its outcome and made only three attempts. But historically, his experiments might be one of the first in China and arguably none of the works by his contemporaries nor artists that came after him can compare to his mesmerizing rendition of the mines. One reason for Fu's success would be his virtuosity with the brushwork, which enabled him to paint different shades of black while articulating brushstrokes meaningfully. These are the same brushworks that he employed in other traditional landscape paintings. The addition of machineries and linings of roads here suggests modernity and resonates with a the prevalent theme of heavy industry popular at the time. But Fu's use of his signature brushstroke, um, as art historians termed the Bausch texture stroke, enables him to create a uniquely vivid texture that enriches his landscape paintings in such a way that really set him apart from his contemporaries. So before we end the lecture, I'd like to show you a Fu Baoshi piece that has not yet been published. This piece used to be in the collection of Fu Baoshi's family, but then it was lost during the Cultural Revolution, and afterwards it had gone into a private collection. Here is steel production. Um, this is really a rare example in which Fu used the format of figure painting to show laborers hard at work. This departure from a signature historical and mythical character was a unique experiment that served to document a scene he witnessed that of teachers participating in steel production work the day before. So these are not actually laborers. On the top left of the piece, he wrote, He wrote the title in the top left. It says, meaning, it is steel that forges man, not the other way around. Fu's family once said in a private interview with my family that they recognized Fu's colleagues from the university, Nanjing Shi Fan Xue Yan, from the faces depicted. So this suggests that the piece is indeed a real life sketch to 
to document this specific event as Fu Bao himself has said in his painting. So here's a picture showing how furnaces look like. It really isn't easy to portray because it looks very solid and not very elegant. Apart from Fu Bao's landscape paintings, he's also known for his classical figure paintings. They would often depict scholars engaging in literary events, such as in this example here, Seven Stages of Bamboo Forest, um, scholars were reading and writing. And then in this one, Pei Pa Hang, uh, Song of the Pipa, scholars are listening to music. And in other examples, like a literary gathering and being a painting, they would be drinking, um, viewing paintings, and sometimes even playing chess. So it's ironic that under the new regime, the scholars in Fu's time had to engage in a very different activity, that of steel production. So we might ask, are they really enjoying the activity? But with their faces covered by goggles here, we might never find out. Many artists responded to the central committee's ambitious policy regarding steel production at the time. For instance, we have Lin Feng Mian, who reenacted a similar scene in Steel Foundry as shown on the left. And Ya Ming, Song Wenzhi, and others collaborated to paint um, Fight for Steel, Wai Gong Ti in 1959. And this combined the elements of landscape painting with that of figure paintings. Um, with relatively enlarged laborers almost hailed as heroes here. There's also Qian Songyan, who was asked to make a steel production painting as well, but refused. According to his daughter, he responded by saying, how does one paint a furnace? Indeed, it, it's not easy to do. So we don't have a piece by Qian Songyan today on the furnace. Coming back to Fu Baoshi's piece, his inscription, might just as well sum up the intellectual's experience during the transformative era post-1949. As they struggle to survive changing and unforgiving times, hoping to contribute to transforming the country for the better, they're all tested by forces of steel time and again. This is the end of my talk. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks to Wo Sans. Uh, excellent lecture. It's very stimulating. Not only I feel this, I'm sure lots of audience, all of the audience feel the same. That's why I receive lots of questions waiting for you to answer. <laughs> okay, yes. So uh, we are we are very uh, thanks to you sharing the lesser known information. Many of the, including the last painting that you share with us, you have already told us that is the first time showing to the public. That we are so glad to to see this, and also uh, lots of information that we really know about uh, Fu Bao Shi. So it's really a very, very good research that uh, you have take out all very difficult, <laughs> yeah, refined materials to share with us. Okay, I should sh stop myself. And then I uh, I have I have some questions, but I think it's better that uh, I pass the audience questions to you. Uh, so Angie, she uh, uh, she she asked. Uh, you show a couple of slides of Fu Bao Shi's demonstrating painting technique to amateur artists. Can you speak more about the amateur painters and their relationship with Fu Bao Shi? Was there any attempt to recruit them to the Jiangsu Traditional Chinese Painting Academy, or did Fu Bao Shi visit any prominent sites of amateur art activities? Yes. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, so that was really um, a thing of the time. So not only Fu Baoshi, but other artists were encouraged to really interact with commoners and amateur artists. And as you can see in the, um, uh, the competition that was raised by uh, several committees, it was one of the goals to really recruit them to the institutes. So they had quite a lot of interactions. And um, during Fu's trip to many places in China, um, the goal was really for them to live together, to enjoy um, how life really was in order to paint reality. So um, Fu Baoshi was building um, quite a rich relationship with anyone around him at the time, if that answers your question. Yes, I, I think you do. <laughs> yes, thanks. So maybe another question is uh, asked by Vincent Wu. 
So uh, he asked, what's the relation between Fu Baoshi's calligraphy and his painting brush work? And uh, the next question following, which are closely related, why did uh, Fu Baoshi prefer Zhuan Shu, which is the clerical script, uh, on his painting in many examples? So um, do you have any idea? Have Thank you, you Vincent, for the questions. Um, so uh, as we all know, Fu Baoshi um, was a master seal carver. So he was actually known for it even before he was known as a painter. A lot of people didn't know that he painted until they went to his 1942 painting that was held in Chongqing. And um, when he did a solo exhibition in Japan, he really um, impressed the Japanese art world at the time by his seal carving. And a lot of important artists went to that show in 1935 in Tokyo. Um, so he really was known for that skill before um, his uh, other shows and for, uh, before he got um, other people aware of his paintings as well. So um, you can see that Fu Baoshi very often inscribed in his paintings um, and that really shows um, his skills as a seal carver. His um, calligraphy also shows that it's very tough. It's not just uh, uh, someone who's not um, good at calligraphy. He's very good at that, and um, it really shows his character. And um, a lot of time he used Zhuan Shu to, um, to write the titles, and um, that would probably convey some sort of solemnity and um, to start off the inscription of whatever poem he was adding to it afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I do see uh, some are uh, written in uh, regular script. So maybe there are still some, something more that related to his patterns when he used calico script and when he used, or just what you have just said. Yes. Okay, so another question by John. Uh, in the early 1960s, a number of traditional landscape by Fu, Fu Baoshi with no symbols of modernity. So his waterfall, for example, his waterfall series were marketed abroad by uh Guo Guo Ji Shu Dian. Yes. So the national uh, book publisher. So many are now in foreign collections. How does this fit in? What's a purely a commercial enterprise? Um thank you for the question. That's very interesting. Um actually Fu Baoshi had maintained his production of um the non- uh, the paintings without any symbols of modernity throughout his lifetime. Um, in his private time, at least, he did a lot of um, paintings, sketches uh, during his trips. And you referring to the ones he did in 1960s, traditional landscapes by Fu. Um, he went on a couple of trips during that time. And um, even during his trip, for instance, to Northeast China, he did a lot um, of the natural landscape as he toured around and um, a lot of them don't necessarily have symbols of modernity. So um, he did both at the same time, um, waterfall series. So I wouldn't say that it was a commercial enterprise because Fu Baoshi really wasn't just thinking about um, marketing his works and he was a true scholar. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Yes, I forget that uh, this is my question follow-up because it's closely related. So the, the last image, the picture that you, you show first, published. Is it for himself or for work? I'm sorry, the, the last that, image. Uh, oh, um, well, I think I might have to ask Fu's family to get more information on that, but it was, I feel like it's like a documentary of what happened, of witnessing um, a scene that was, uh, that was very significant, that was representative of his time. Uh, so probably so, it's personal work, but uh, yes, a kind yeah. of documentary. Well, it's, I don't see it published anywhere else, so maybe it didn't go to the public, and maybe it's a personal documentary. Yes, thank you. And then another question is from my colleague, Peter. So an important element in Chinese landscape painting is the void. So can you say a few words about what has happened with the void in the later paintings of Fu Baoshi? Thank you. Oh, um, the void in the, the, the water yeah. and space. Um, in landscape painting. Sure. Um, I think he kept a lot of that in uh, throughout his life, but it really depends on the painting that he did. Um, 
For instance, in his Mao-inspired poems, uh, sometimes he would do a lot of lakes or some uh, misty clouds, and there is still quite a lot of void in those paintings, I think. I don't know if that answers the question, but perhaps it'll be helpful to have some examples to refer to and talk about this. Um, but that's a very interesting question. I would love to look at some works and talk about that later. Yes. Uh, so uh, next question by William. So he said, very interesting talk with little seen illustrations. I guess we all ask ourselves, what was the mood of artists working in the 50s? Were they forced to work in this way or did they buy into the social pol political movement of the time? So I think his question is more general, not particularly on Fu Bao Shi. Any idea? Um, thank you, William, for the question. I think that's a very interesting one because uh, the 50s really was a special time. And um, a lot of artists were trying to just struggle and survive. And in order to be to remain, to, to have their job and to continue painting um, with the blessing of the party, they would have to do certain things. And um, I think they're all really trying to understand what the new era and the new leadership wanted and um, sort of went along with it. Um, so, but it really depends on the, the, the artists that were there. Fu Baoshi himself, for instance, um, he was... As um, we show, we've seen in the letter in the late 40s, he was really not sure how he was going to uh, survive after the new leadership came in. He was he was considering leaving, and it was all really chaotic uh, mentally for him, and actually uh, um, in real life as well with the war and everything going on. So it really was a period of experimentation, and um, he was um, he was really quite a genius in thinking. Uh, up the idea of doing a um, Mao inspired poem um, and later on went along with um, many other public paintings because that brought him um, a blessing from the party. Um, but he's just one example and it's very interesting to see how different artists survived during that time. Yes, thank I you. I think we can definitely go on uh, for a very long time on this question. But yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, we have to, 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 to conduct more research on it because not many nooks or yes diary that survive that we know more about how the artists really feel at that time. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Last question uh, from the audience. Uh, thank you very much for the stimulating lecture. I'm not familiar with Fu Bao Shi and I'd like to ask more about the signature Bao, Bao Shi stroke. Yes. How is it unique? And can you show us how he executed this in one of the Ko Mai painting? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Venus, for the question. Um, so it's very technical, but basically, the you can share the screen if you think sure. it helps, or, or you have, or your background. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 this yeah. is not coal mining. Uh, not very um, yeah. coal mining. Let me go back to coal mining. Um, actually, so the Bausch texture stroke is. Um, Mixture between between Zhongfeng and Sanfeng, um, and he it's like mm, you would call me Lei Changzhang, meaning that you can see uh, uh, some of his strokes, even though it seemed like it was very messy, but it's actually not. It was a combination of um, using the middle of the brush, he would go down. Um, there there are some essays on this uh, specific technique that Fu wrote, and it was also published in this book, I see. So um, I think if you refer to it and see some uh, other scholars discuss it in detail, it would be very helpful. But I'm not sure if I can share my PowerPoint. Do you think it's working? Yes, yes, I, I see it. Yes, you did, you did share the screen. Yes, successfully. Oh, okay. Yeah. So for instance, this one really, um, this one shows his Bausch texture stroke um, quite clearly in the middle here. In the middle of the strata, um, you can see that he has um, the strokes around. I don't know how to describe that, but it's very, uh, um, it seems like he's swirling the brush, but you can at the same time see the detail. So it's not a block of ink. It's You see a lot of brush strokes around it too. Is it more like dry blush or wet blush? Yeah. 
Well, I think it's a mixture of all of that. Thank you very much for showing us. <laughs> yes, I don't think that's very clear, but um, yeah. Yes, I think uh, it's uh, almost time. Uh, Time now. Uh, thank you very much again for sharing your your in depth research and then also show us uh, the where we wear painting and also you have a new perspective on, I mean to to research or understand Fu Bao Shi. Yeah, because most of us know very well about his figure painting and landscape painting, but not knowing his like the the element, the modern element in his painting. So. Uh, for the audience, uh, welcome to join us and then stay till the very end. We look forward to uh, to have you again in our next lecture service. And our next event is for the coming Thursday evening. There will be a screening on a documentary on paper making. And the director, Olivia Wang, will have a roundtable discussion with us. So uh, do register or please come uh, to, to UMAC so, uh, to, to meet us again. And then you're also welcome to register uh, or Check the information on websites and then register to receive more information about our forthcoming uh, lecture events. So thanks again to Vosen. Yes. Thank and thanks to all the audience. Well, see you again. Bye-bye.